Chapter Fifteen of Thirty Two Caliber by Donald McGibney. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thirty Two Caliber by Donald McGibney. Chapter Fifteen. The Answer. The coroner and I drove out to the bridge that afternoon, and I must admit I was mighty poor company. Mary's unreasonableness, her stupid obstinacy, when she knew she was wrong and I was right. Her willingness to break our friendship at the first opportunity gave me little room to think of anything else. That she should risk her reputation to run after that man was inexplicable, but it was just like a woman. Show them a place they must not go, or a man they must not see, and they will sacrifice life, liberty, and everyone else's happiness to satisfy their curiosity. It has been true from Pandora to Pankhurst. Well, if she could get along without me, I could get along without her. I'm the easiest going person in the world, but when it comes to allowing the girl you are practically engaged to to make a fool of herself over another man, I won't stand for it. I knew she would probably come to me afterward and say that she was sorry and she didn't know, but I made up my mind that she would have to give me an awfully good reason for her sudden interest in Frank Woods before I would forgive her. These thoughts held my attention all the way out. Now and again I would be recalled from my gloom by some question from the coroner. He was trying to solve the problem of who murdered Jim, and I am sure that he must have thought it strange that I was so preoccupied. As we neared the bridge I noticed again how scant the vegetation was on both sides of the road. Anyone wishing to murder Jim would have been able to see him coming for at least a half a mile. On the left side of the road was clay soil, sparsely covered with weeds and shrubs, while a half a mile away could be seen the thirteenth hole of the country club golf links. When we reached the crest of the hill, leading down to the bridge, our eyes at once caught sight of a tall maple tree on the right-hand side of the road, and about two hundred yards from it. As he saw it, the coroner gave a grunt of satisfaction. There's our tree. We stopped the car and scrambled through the thorny bushes that lined the road. The ground was hard clay, with only burdock and weeds growing on it. There was nothing that would lead us to believe that anyone had been there before. When we reached the tree, the coroner examined the ground around it carefully. When he rose, he seemed disappointed. "'What did you expect to find here?' I asked. "'I didn't know what we might find. If the man who fired those shots used this tree, I thought we might find an empty cartridge or two. There ought to be at least some broken twigs or something to show that he was up there, but I find nothing at all. Still, the fact that the tree is where it is makes the theory plausible. He shook his head. No, now that I've seen how far we are from the road, I don't think it does. Those bullet holes in the back of the car were fired from above and behind the machine. They slanted down, but not sideways. If the tree had been at the very edge of the road, our theory would have been acceptable. But if the murderer used this tree, two hundred yards from the road, he would have started firing before the car came opposite, with the possibility that the holes would have been found in the side of the car. I'm sorry, for when I saw this tree, I thought we'd struck the right track. There's one thing I can't make out, I stated, and that is the strange cry of my sister in her delirium. Look out, Jim, it's going to hit us, she called out, and I would be willing to swear it had something to do with the murder. The coroner thought a moment, then turned to me. What else did she say? Nothing that seemed to refer to the accident. All the rest was apparently delirium. She begged forgiveness for some fancied wrong, and repeated that a certain man was not guilty of dishonesty. But her first weird cry had to do with the murder, I'm sure. We walked back toward the road. High overhead we heard the droning of an airplane, and we both stopped to gaze at it. Suddenly the coroner clapped me on the shoulder. I've got it! What do you mean? I asked, bewildered. The airplane, man. Who owns an airplane around here? I don't know. There are several at the aviation ground. What's that got to do with it? Everything, don't you see? The bullets fired from above and behind. The number of bullets fired, those two bullet holes in the floorboard of the car, everything points to an airplane. 
It was done a hundred, yes, a thousand times in the war. While I was over there with my hospital unit, we used to get a lot of cases of motorcycle dispatch riders who had been picked off by German aviators. They machine-gunned moving trains and military automobiles. It is one of the simplest tricks of a pilot's repertoire. Has Woods an airplane? He was a military pilot in the French Army, and is the head of an airplane firm, but I don't think he has an airplane here. He could get one easy enough. The clever devil! Look over there! He has the broad sweep of the golf course as a perfect landing ground, and this road hasn't a tree on it for miles. He could have come down within fifty feet of the ground and followed that car, pumping bullets into it all the way. He had absolutely everything in his favor. For a moment I saw red as I pictured Jim, helpless before approaching death. I could imagine Helen's agony as she saw that dim black shape coming closer and closer and screamed in her terror, Look out, Jim! It's going to hit us! Yes, but how are we going to prove it? I asked. That's up to us now. An airplane has such speed that it was easy for Woods to fashion an ingenious alibi to account for every minute of his time on the night of the murder, but there must be some holes in it. There always is in a manufactured alibi. I want you to go over to the country club and check up Mr. Woods' schedule of that night, while I examine the golf links to see if he landed there. We jumped into my car and drove rapidly to the club. I went into the house by the back way to avoid meeting people, and asked for Jackson. Jackson, what time did Mr. Woods get out here on the evening Mr. Felderson was killed? I expect he got here about six o'clock, Mr. Thompson, the Negro replied. Did you see him at the time? Did I seize him at that time? Let me see. Why, no, sir, I don't think so. I don't think I did. When was the first time you did see him, Jackson? I guess it was at dinner time, sir. He was here then. You sure he was here all through dinner, I asked. Yes, sir. He must have been, cause he ordered dinner. What time was he through dinner, do you know? The darky scratched his head. I reckon it war just before he ordered me to bring him dat drink. And was he here all that time? I demanded. Yes, sir. He was right here, sir. Where did he sit? Let me see. I recollect now. He asked me special for dat table over yonder by the winder. Can you find the boy that waited on the table that night? The old darky hurried away, but came back presently leading a scared yellow boy by the sleeve. Now, George Henry, you all quit yours contrariness. You answer de gentleman's questions, or I lo I whoop ya. George, did you wait on that table over there by the window two weeks ago? Yeah, yes, sir. I've been waiting on that table for more a month. Do you remember waiting on Mr. Frank Woods two weeks ago last Thursday night? I asked. The boy was trembling. He rolled frightened eyes toward Jackson, who was glaring at him. Finally he broke into a wail. Oh, Pappy Jackson, does all yous knows? He tell me he goin' to de bath and effin' anybody ask where he go dat night to send him in there. Just tell me what you know, George, I said, motioning the angry Jackson away. He, he sat down at de table, but he ain't it none, the boy stuttered. What do you mean, George? He sit down and he look out de winder. I bring him some soup. But he got up powerful sudden, like he had a call to the telephone, and he ain't come back. Are you sure of that, George? Yes, sir. I asked him did he want dinner after he come back, but he say he ain't hungry. What time was it when he came back? I asked. Half past eight, sir. I gave the boy a dollar, and he went away happy. Jackson had a sheepish look on his face. Then Mr. Woods wasn't here all through dinner, Jackson. Drat dat boy, he make me out a liar for a dollar, he grinned. Are you sure, absolutely sure, that you saw Mr. Woods at half past eight? I questioned. Yes, sir, you can't catch me up no mo. 
I saw Mr. Woods at 8.25 exactly. I handed him a bill and went into the bar. Grogan, the old bartender, was there alone. Grogan, do you remember who was in the bar between 7.30 and 8.30 on the night of the Felderson murder? Only one or two of the gentlemen, sir. There was Mr. Farnsworth and Mr. Brown and I think Mr. Woods. Are you sure Mr. Woods was in here? Well, no, sir, not exactly. I remember Mr. Farnsworth and Mr. Brown. There were probably some others. The reason I think Mr. Woods was here was because he called my attention to the fact a few nights after the murder. There were a few gentlemen in here, and they were talking of Mr. Felderson's death. Mr. Woods said, in view of the fact that the murderer hadn't been found, almost anyone might be accused. Someone asked him if he was worried. We all knew, sir, that Mr. Felderson and Mr. Woods were not very friendly, and Mr. Woods laughed and said that fortunately he had a perfect alibi, and called my attention to the fact that he was here at about the time the crime was committed. "'And you're not so sure that he was?' I asked. "'Oh, his alibi is good, of course, because he was around the club all that evening. I guess he was here, and I don't remember it.' I shook hands with him and left. Far out on the golf links the coroner was bending over, examining something on the ground. When I reached him, he grabbed me by the sleeve and pointed to barely discernible tracks paralleling each other for almost a hundred yards. Between them ran a shallow, jagged rut where the spade of an airplane had dug up the turf. End of chapter 15